I thought today we might talk a bit about intelligence. So I hope we'll have an intelligent conversation. (laughs) Intelligence by default. It fascinates me. The theory of evolution fascinates me. For years I tried to. I really, really tried to. But I can share the sentiment with the man that I'm going to introduce you to. Professor Anthony Flew. He's a professor in philosophy. He was the dear heart of the evolutionary circles and atheistic societies. He wrote a number of books. He wrote a number of books and they were bestsellers. And at one time, I think it was in 2004 or 2005, I can't remember, he shocked the scientific world because he said, there is a God. Here, there is an intelligent designer. What I've been looking at all those years, he said he misinterpreted. He was intellectually honest. He was willing to publicly state that he had been mistaken for all those years. Regardless of the effect of his reputation. I admire that. I admire that. We have to be honest, right? We have to be honest. My question is this. So one moment, he's an atheist, he's an evolutionist. Next moment, he's a believer in God. The God of the Bible, by the way. And yet, the information that he holds, at whatever level it might be, of whatever discipline of science it might be, one moment you're on that side, next moment after a reconsideration, you're on the other side. This is what he said. This is what he said. He said in his book, There is a God, which was published in 2007, page 74, I simply had to go where the evidence leads. That's what he said. What I think the DNA material has done is that it has shown by the unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life. Well, that's an honest observation. It's fair. And it's scientifically very irresponsible because he's right about the complexity. Absolutely right. That's what he said. I simply had to go where the evidence leads. He said that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinary diverse elements to work together. And he decided it's impossible to apply to this the philosophy of evolution as an answer. So let's have a look at some of the fossils. We always come down the fossils. I like fossils. Fossils are the preserved remains of traces of animals, plants, and other organisms from the remote past. I just want to run past a few, and I want to have a look on the other side a little bit for a while. Uh, David Attenborough, as you know, a very gifted man, naturalist. He's uh, is marvelous what they what he produces what he uh, but of course he's an avowed evolutionist and i remember the excitement that he that he had when we found ida that's a lemur there there was a little heel bone by way of variation which then was considered a transitional type by now it's all gone of course that's what normally happens not terribly tall. It was found here, in just south of Frankfurt, Messelpit, and, and, and I have to tell you that it was an uh, unused um, shale mine, if you like. Shale, of course, is a, uh, uh, is a particular type of rock which is sedimentary of nature. 
And that makes it all very interesting. I, I just want to... I just want to talk a bit about this. It wasn't just Ida that they found and, and placed her in 47 million years old. And I'm going to talk about this long ages. We need to talk about that. We need to talk about that. Of course, it has the, nip, uh, the name of Darwinius Massile, approximately 47 million years old, based on the dating of the fossil site. I've been trying to find out how they dated the fossil site, I still don't know. Other than assuming the layers where they find it. Because there is a problem with the dating, and we're going to talk about a problem with dating. Um, no, no, uh, dating fossils, that is. And so we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Here are some of the <coughs> fossils that they found on that very site. Here is a uh, 49, a 2 million year much older than, a 49 million year old fish fossil. Now, no chips, it's just the, the imprint of the fish, do you understand? And so, here's another one, here's another one, also 49 million years old. Uh, an interesting little fossil, uh, pretty well the same. Uh, and then they are 40 million years old. We come back to the dating issue. We must, we must. So here is a primitive horse, which was the size of a fox. Um, let me have a look at some of the others here. A crocodile is represented here. The Diplocinodon Darwini. Darwin gets a lot of mileage out of all these fossils. His name is uh, very often noted, of course. Uh, I, I just have something to share with you here. 49 million year old small bird, and then they said, oh, I was showing how well the feathers and the body tissues have been preserved. There's no body tissues, it's only imprint. And so is the feathers, but that's okay. Uh, when you look at this, and, and here you have a 49 million year old giant ant, the Formicum gigantium, winged ant which perished during a mating flight. Unsafe sex, 49 million years ago. <laughs> and here is another one. A 49 year old, a 49 million year old rodent, the Aloravis macruris, similar to a squirrel, looks like a squirrel to me. A 49 million year old freshwater turtles, all from the same site. Now that's interesting. Did you see the variety of animals that we found on that site? And since we have sedimentary rock, it must have been a cataclysmic a disaster that has found place to get a collection of these, because this is very rare. What I've shown you is actually quite rare. Uh, most fossils, 95% is sea life, some form of sea life that's not non-mobile. And then you get a very small 0.005%, 2, 5% that actually has more than one bone. It's very rare. Our fossils are very interesting. They're fascinating. I'm not saying they're not. But here they're all hurdled together as a mass of variety of species and types and kinds, and it could have only been done by a flood. Now, how do you get to the 47 to 49 million years old? Well, that's your problem. What are the dating methodologies? We'll come back to one in a minute. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but I just want to talk about it. Carbon-14 cannot be exercised on any of these fossils because you have no tissue containing uh, carbon-14. You don't get a reading. What is interesting, you then have to, the only other possibility is to date, is to date the rocks. But if you have sedimentary rock, you don't have, and you may not understand this, you don't have isotopes. Unlikely to find any. So what are you going to do? How do you go for dating? Well, you go by the layers, you see. And I've had this conversation a number of times, and it goes like this. So what do you date? Well, we go by the layers. And where we find that, we make an, an assumption, an, an, a determination, how old that fossil must be. How many million years? That's great. That's very good. Now you say to yourself, but how do you know how old that fossil is? Well, we, we date that by the, by the layers in which we find them. How do you date the layers? Well, we date it by the fossil that we find. You know, it's a bit like this. What do you believe? What do you believe? I believe what my church believes. Good. 
Uh, what does your church believe? Well, my church believes what I believe. What do you and your church believe? Well, we believe the same thing. It's a circular reasoning which doesn't really hold. And I'm going to give you seriously examples this afternoon or where it would appear that dating has no place at all, not some of the radiometric dating. I'm not against a carbon-14. I think it can be useful, but there are reservations about it which I won't go into. Now, here we have a 49 million year old fossil of a monkey's hand. The lemur, Ida, only 47 million years old, supposed to be the forerunner of the primates of, uh, such as the monkeys. But there it is. Nobody picked up on that. That's all right. Sedimentary rock usually do not contain radioisotopes. But now here is something very interesting. All coal has a carbon-14 traces at least reading, which is very interesting. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. And every time it halves, you double the time. Now this is very interesting. There's assumptions there as well. But what is interesting is this. Uh, what is coal? What is coal? Carbon. Yeah, carbon, that's fine. That's good. What, but, but what is it? Compressed. Compressed. Huh? Compressed vegetation. Of every 10 meters of, of, of vegetation, very much compressed, you might get one meter of decent coal. That's what that is. So it has it organic tissue and it should have a carbon-14 reading. It's interesting <coughs> that that is true about coal. You can still find the traces. It's supposed to have occurred over millions of years, but it couldn't be if it contains readings of carbon-14. It's just an interesting aspect. I dealt with that in the other church last, uh, la yeah, uh, yeah, last week, wasn't it? Last week, yeah. It's interesting. The whole theory that coal forms over millions of years is, is absolutely untrue and has no scientific basis whatsoever. Okay, here we go. Let's look at the fossils. They really confirm the biblical flood. If you really, really seriously study the fossil records and what you find, how you find it, and exactly where you find it, it's interesting, it's fascinating. I mean, if you look at coral alone, coral itself, uh, are well within the Arctic circles. Of course, not live coral. This used to be alive once. And that poses a tremendous problem as well. It's interesting if you study the Bible, the creation, as the Bible reflects on it, it fits the facts absolutely perfectly. Absolutely the scenario blends beautifully. Let's have a look at radiometric dating. Radiometric dating, uh, that is probably when it comes to the rocks, rubidium strontium, potassium argon, or uranium lead. Now you say that means nothing to me. Well, those are the three main ones. There are other ones. But they're based, <coughs> they're used to quantify the ages of the strata and the fossils. Have a look at this. Based on three main assumptions. Now, let's look at them. The presumed original system status. That means that I assumed a certain condition, measure the change, and give expression by way of a time frame. That's what you do. A closed physical chemical system. No intervention, no interference. It is protected as a process. The rate of decay must have always been constant. In other words, no variation of intensity or variation in speed. That is just the way it happened. These are three main assumptions, and none of the above assumptions are either valid or provable. I'm going to try to make it very simple, very simplified. You have a whole stack of books on the left side. There you have a whole stack of books on the right side. And uh, there is me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying... No, it's not me. I know. He's got red hair. Nose is big enough. But anyway, he, he carries the books from one end to the other. So from point A, he goes to point B. 
And you may look at him and he say, now I can see he takes so many books and I'm going to time him and I can tell, looking at that stack of books here, how long he has been doing that and I can give an exact time because I'm observing how fast he goes, how much he carries, how far he walks and the way he stacks it, I can calculate. Are you following me so far? But you have a problem. You have a problem. See, the first one, you presume that you know the original status. You presume there were no books here. Get it? So you don't know that. There's another problem, and this is what I'm trying to, with a very simple example, trying to bring home to you, a closed physical chemical system. Okay, that doesn't apply here. But let's say, let's say I had a helper. You don't know that. You got no idea. I might have, and I would have gone twice as fast at least. Uh, the rate of decay must have been always constant. In other words, if I deduct from here and go to there, well, I might have had a lot of energy at the beginning, and I would have been faster. In the, in the natural world, it might be a matter of, uh, take uranium lead. Uranium is quite mobile if it's exposed to, to rain, to water. Then there are heat variations. They all can have an impact on that on the, the rate of decay. So we are assuming none of the above assumptions are either provable or valid. It's just a simple comparison, if you like. But you go back to the physical world, you'll find those restrictions actually apply. That's the interesting thing. Radiometric dating only with igneous and metamorphic rocks because of the the way that the isotopes are formed, you cannot find them in the sedimentary rock. They just don't have them. Which means you cannot apply any radiometric dating really to that. If you look at the Great Grand Canyon there, which is absolutely magnificent, uh, particularly at sunset and sunrise, it's interesting when you look at the layers here, confirming the actual floods, that the, the flood that has occurred, projecting the layers in massive quantities, no, tra no transitional, absolutely no transitional layers whatsoever. It didn't happen over a protracted period of time. It happened at, during a cataclysmic event. It must have the layers are such. It's interesting, they used to take various, uh, what shall I say, uh, measurements or datings. They would find that you would come to a particular layer where you have one billion years estimation of time. The interesting thing is they go lower and then they find one that is younger by about 250 million years, which means you have a problem. It, 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 just, it just doesn't happen, does it? Uh, that has, this is probably one of the best examples. There are so many. I'll, I'll give you the very best in a minute. Uh, this is in New Zealand, Mount, how do you pronounce it? Nagaruhu, something like that. Eleven samples were collected from five recent lava flows during the fieldwork in January 1996. Two each from February 11th. Now, look at the dates. These are recorded. These are rec uh, recorded uh, uh, incidents from the 11th of February 1949, 4th of June 1954, the 14th of July 54. The flows, the lava flows from the 19th February 1975 avalanche deposits, and three from the 3rd of June 1950 for flow. And when you look at that report, with the dating, and I think it was rubidium strontium, they came, oh no, potassium argon, they came to the ages, it were to range from 270,000 years to 3.5 million years for rocks which were observed to have cooled uh, from lavas 25 to 50 years ago. Can you see the problem here? Can you see that, or are you, are you with me here? It's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it's a huge problem. Of course, that doesn't. Here you have Mount St. Helens. Does anybody remember when that occurred? Tell me. <coughs> when did that occur? 1950. Uh, 1980. I'm sorry. What did you say? Did you say something like that? 1980 it happened. You know, it was all steam that blew the top off. This is just before, and this is straight after, that the, the tidal wave course in the lake shaved 
all the trees off, and that whole top was blown off. It was absolutely incredible. Incredible. Now, what is even more incredible, they dated that. The dating test was done 12 years after the event, June 1992. The, 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 the variety of measurement in itself is already sus, but here we have a range from 350,000 to 2.8 million years. Yet we all know it happened at 1980. You can even get DVDs of that. That makes you wonder why they apply the dating methodology at all. At all. Uh, there are so many examples. The chemical analysis is correct. There's nothing wrong with those people. They do that right. The prepositions are absolutely incorrect. They are not validated. They do not help you to reach to a correct reading at all. The conclusions, therefore, must be wrong. Have a look at the cell, the living cell. Last time when, when I was at, uh, at uh, Macquarie Uni, the dialogue was in progress with, uh, with the atheist on this basis, that evolution is only uh, that process which finds place with the first living biological cell. Did you just follow that? So we don't want to touch how it got there. We don't want to know. When Richard Dawkins was asked, he said, we don't know. Okay, fair. We don't know. Well, we do know. But let's say we start from that. And we bypass what is probably the most difficult part, but if we look at that, this is just an artist's impression. If you look inside, the miniaturization that finds place in a living cell is enormous. There are whole factories, there are whole uh, instrumentations for replication and duplication and, and, uh, and, and dividing capacities and enzymes that induce all these processes. When you really look at it, and, and to me, to me, it's the membrane that really made me walk away from evolution. Because when you look at a living cell that has a metabolism, the waste products have to be, have to be eliminated. And so you got to find an environment that takes it off your hand, but that environment also has to provide you also with the nutrients and the energy that you require, which can only come from the environment. And that makes it extraordinarily interesting. You, it's not just a, a living biological cell you're talking about. You are also talking about a conducive environment that supports that cell and allows it to go on. And uh, <clears throat> that's quite an ask. So when you, when you ask, well, where did that first cell, that biological cell, come from? Uh, it might have been seeded, we call that. Exogenesis, meaning off away from this planet. Now you've got another problem. The nearest planet that looks a bit like us is about 10.5 light years away. Not only have you put the problem from here to over there, you now have also added a, 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 a transportation problem, haven't you? How does anything organic survive in space, unprotected? We then are talking flying saucers, aren't we? Now, serious, it's a problem. It is a real problem. It cannot be explained away. Mutations. If, unless a cell survives and it uh, uh, obviously duplicates, mitosis, etc., you need, you need mutations in order to get from the information that you have in that cell, you need to get more information if you want to go from simple to complex. Are you all agreeing with me? Now let's have a look at the process. Mutations, there are three possibilities. Detrimental, neutral, or beneficial. When we look at those, the one on the left first, if it's detrimental, it's a disease, it's a disorder, there is no evolution. Would you agree? Couldn't be. Now we look at neutral, no change. No change at all, uh, no evolution. Now we look at the beneficial one. 
If there's no new information, there cannot be an evolution because we need the extra information to upgrade, correct? Now, what you can get as a beneficial mutation is a change of the morphology, that is the shape and certain other conditions that might make a species survive much better. The little beetle that with the wings and that then it loses the wings because of a mutation that loses information. It normally is based on a loss of information. What is interesting, unless, unless of course, if you add information, you get a changed morphology and evolution is a possibility, not a given, but it is a possibility. Do you understand? But the problem is that has never been observed any new information from any mutation. I repeat, there is no record anywhere from observing an increase of information from a mutation. If they're too big, the mutations, they invariably are detrimental. The minor ones remain neutral, or some of them, in some instances, very small percentage, they can be beneficial. There's a variety of them, but none of them give you the extra information. You need new information before you possibly could have an evolution. Are you with me here? I'm just taking it, I'm thinking, and I hope you do the same with me. The ultimate proof of ultimate design, the DNA, the dioxyribonucleic acids, which is a fantastic storage device. It's absolutely incredible. The miniaturization, uh, you look at the chromosomes, made up of the genes. The genes are made up of, of course, of the DNA. It's absolutely incredible. The four-letter code, it is fantastic. It is fantastic. This is a blueprint. We've seen those. We've all seen those. This shows you how it's going to be done, how it works or supposed to work. This gives you all the information and with all that information you can go ahead and execute the construction. That's what you need first. You need that first. 1953, James Watson and Francis Creek um, discovered the DNA. And they didn't quite realize what they had discovered, because it certainly changed the biology and the physiology. It's just, just an incredible, an incredible discovery what they made. It's fantastic, really. Uh, I think Francis Creek is the one that still is alive. He believes also that the first biological cell was seeded. That was his belief at the time, anyway. Now, what is interesting, when you look at, and we can play with facts and figures which will go in one ear and go out the other, what I'm trying to say, the information is just absolutely incredible. Three billion letters in a single cell is just, a chromosome is absolutely fantastic. Dr. Stephen Meyer is a creationist, director, senior fellow of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle. It's only a couple of rooms, it's not big, they're not well funded. If you're a creationist, you don't get funded very well. You've got to be an evolutionist to be funded properly. But this is, he speaks a lot. He's a good speaker. He says this, and this is what I'm going to take you, want to take you. DNA actually stores information. It is not the information <coughs> itself. There's a difference. Are you following me so far? Okay. In his book, The Case for the Creator, he comments on that. Then he goes on to say it's like a computer code or a language. Now, we all understand that. We all grasp this. That's fine. That's fine. Have a look at this man, Professor Philip Johnson. He's actually a professor at law, but he's been very active in the debate, extremely active. I like his mind. Defeating Darwinism by opening minds. He said, all you've got to do is open your mind. Don't close it. Don't close it. This is what he says. The content of the message is independent of the medium. Now, I have in my thing there, in my case, I have a Bible, obviously. That's just a hard copy. Most of you have it by little apps on the phones. I have, I don't know how many of them, on the computer. 
The medium is different, but the message is the same. It's still the same Bible. King James, New King James, whatever you want. Yeah? So what we have here, we got to distinct between the message and the medium. You follow me there. I know you do. And so uh, the DNA molecule is the medium. It is not the message. It is not the message. Keep thinking. Keep thinking. I like him. <laughs> He's, you can find him on the, um, on the YouTubes and all of that. He's still very active. Professor Werner Gitt, director and professor at the German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology. The man is a creationist. He's not dumb. You don't get that. You don't get there. That's earned. Always earned. In the beginning was information. I think it's a great title. In the beginning, God. Yeah, but he says was information. I think it's a great title. He says this, since the DNA code has all the essential characteristics of information, it does do that. If you look at it, it's coded, you know, the four-letter codes there, that is true. There must have been a sender. So, in other words, if there is a message, if there's a code, then it must come from somewhere. Would you normally agree with that? Yes, it is. Okay. Since the density and the complexity of the DNA is millions of times greater than man's present technology, he says, the sender must have been supremely intelligent. This is way beyond our capacity, what we see by way of information. It is incredible. I don't think we can even evaluate it yet. Now, then he says this, since the sender must have encoded the information into the DNA molecule and constructed the molecular bio machines to encode. This is done in the cell before replication uh, to encode and then decode. You've got to decode, you've got to read it and then execute the process and run it. And that's what all happens in the cells. There's a lot to think about. It's not easy, but I, I think you, so far, I think everybody's grasping a little bit what I'm saying here, what he's saying. Yeah. The sender must be purposeful as supremely powerful. Well, I think I can identify with that. Since information is a non-material entity, and cannot originate from matter. And this is what I want to dwell on a bit further later. A message is not dependent on the medium. If it's a message, it must have a sender, and it certainly should have a recipient. It is not determined by matter or energy. That's very important. Very important. The sender must have a non-material component, such as intellect, intelligence. Since biological information can only originate from an intelligent sender, then all theories of chemical and biological evolution are based on the premise that information solely comes from matter and energy. If you are an evolutionist, you must believe that all information comes from matter and energy. Because Einstein taught us that matter is energy and energy is matter. Without, the two are correlated. And in the atomic age that we live, we can identify with that. But what he's saying here, the information then must, per definition of evolution, must come from matter or energy, or both. Are you with me so far? Can it? Impossible. Then the theories of chemical and biological evolution are false. Unless that can be proven, that information can come from matter, evolution is not on. There is no other evidence that you have. Now, I can take you to the museum, and there's rows and rows and rows, and none of them are evidence. None of them are evidence. The stories that, that, 
that are attached to some of these items, it's incredible how they get away with it. Let's just take 10 points. That'll bring us to a conclusion. Anything material, such as physical, chemical processes, cannot create something non-material. Does that resonate with you? Did you get that? Uh, we've got little ice buckets, if you get a little bit sleepy. We have them, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> We're raising funds, you see. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Did you get that? Anything material, such as physical, chemical processes, cannot create something non-material. Information is a non-material fundamental entity and not a property of matter. This is important. It is not the property of matter. It cannot give you information. Uh, Professor Norbert Wiener, he died I think in 1968, brilliant mind, mathematician. He said, what is information? Information is information, neither matter nor energy. They're not related. They're not. That's a fact. Go to argument number three. Information requires a material medium for storage and transmission. I can agree with that. It does. Absolutely. Four. Information cannot originate in statistical processes. I can collect, collate, compare. That in itself does not give me new information if I only, only collect, collect, uh, collate existing data. So it doesn't origin, originate like that. It cannot. There can be no information without a code. There has to be a certain code. A code that is suitable, conducive for sending and receiving. All codes result from an intentional choice and agreement between sender and recipient. If I stood here in front of you and I was rambling on in my own language, which is Dutch, as you might have picked from my accent, there's very little convenience of message to you because I don't think any of you speak Dutch, do you? I should try it one time. Okay. So, it needs to be suitable. The determination of the meaning for and from a set of symbols is a mental process that requires intelligence. If I have information and I develop a code of transmission that functions also well for the recipient in order to receive it, then the thought patterns or that whatever constructs the actual code, that requires intelligence. Are you with me? You can't just convey a thought in a book by uh, writing silly, what shall I say, without syntax, a vocabulary. It must have these qualities in order to express an abstract concept. Do you understand me? Very important. So that's number seven. Number eight. There can be no new information without an intelligent, purposeful sender. If you want to top up your information, it's got to come from the same source, nowhere else. Any given chain of information can be traced back to an intelligent source. Fair enough. You get a letter in the mail, it'll always tell you, it will always tell you where it comes from. Yeah? Well, it should anyway. That's the purpose. Information comprises the non-material foundation for all technological systems, work of art, or biological systems. Would you agree with that? Everybody? You're happy with that. Here is the wonderful thing. The reality is, have a look at this. Um, Randy, what is the weight of a computer? How, uh, how kilo? This whole lot. So there's your, there is your, uh, your clever little tablet, and that is your mobile smartphone. Weigh them all together. One kilo. You walk in the shop and you buy it. You unwrap it, and there it is. And uh, there's, there's nothing on it yet. No, there's no programs, and that's okay. You put it on the scales, and it weighs exactly it weighs exactly one kilo, all three of them. Now, 
the shop owner, being a smart businessman, says, I'll put these and these and these and these on it, these apps, these software programs, and he puts all the programs on. You name it, Skype, you know what I mean? Uh, Photoshop, the latest, all the other things. And I pro you know, there's so many of them. And he does it all, is thrown in with the prize. I take the same lot, the three, the notepad, the smartphone, and the computer, and I put it on the scale. How much heavier would it weigh? Same. The information does not add mass. None. It's the same. It's information. It has no weight. It has no mass. It requires a medium, that's all. How are you going to get evolution? How you get evolution when you take away the capacity of material to give you the information? What is left? I just wanted to reason with you this afternoon. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I, I would be very happy if there were any bright ideas out there how this could be proven wrong. But I've quoted some rather eminent men in their science disciplines that are very active in telling people that evolution could not have happened because the information was not there in the material world. It was never there. It requires intelligence. Now, I might be preaching to the converted. I'm just saying it's nice for you to know that a logical reasoning is almost sufficient to see the plain fact that there must have been an intelligence that designed and gave us the information, giving it in certain forms and ways and modes and codes, whatever. But there had to be an intelligence, and I like the title of that book, In the Beginning, Intelligence. I think it's a lovely title. I think it's really good. <coughs> now, so you go to your Bible, and I read here that in Isaiah 45, you know, it's interesting, we talked about that in the last empire, the prophets of Isaiah, that 160 years before the event, he describes the fall of Babylon. He describes how it was done by drying up the river. He describes the people that are going to do it, the Medes and Persians. He describes the leader, the one who gets the brainwave, how to take a city that could not be taken by warfare of the day. He names him Cyrus. Eighty years at least before he was born, probably more like a hundred years. They're arguing how old Cyrus was when he took the city. He took it in 539. This, this prediction was made in 700 BC. Give or take one or two years, no more. Could easily defend that. It's remarkable when a book can tell you. Uh, it is so good that people said it must have been written after the event. Of course, that's not true. Or you find it on the internet. And they say, oh, no, 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 it was written after the event. I can assure you, having viewed the documents, or at least copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's two full copies. No, that's not true. The syntax and everything, the grammar, is exactly of the era that it's supposed to be, 700 BC. And by the way, Jesus and all the apostles and all the Jews still today refer to the prophet Isaiah. If Isaiah would have reported after the fact, he would have been an historian, and he was never known as that. So it's interesting that, that God makes himself known through Isaiah to a man by the name of Cyrus who gets a Bible study from an, a very eminent scholar by the name of Daniel who happens to be there. And the interesting thing is, Cyrus, who's not a fool, sees the writing and he sees the writing about him like someone knew him before he was born. This is a stunning prophecy, and the Bible is full of these things. 
Sometimes I wonder, I think to myself, why can it be that there are still people walking around who do not believe the truthfulness of the Bible? And the simple answer is, they don't know about these prophecies. Why are there so many people who say to you, oh, evolution is a fact? Science has proven it. And I remember sitting there, standing there before this atheist, and I said, if you have absolute irrefutable proof, I'll write down my email address, send it to me, but it better be irrefutable proof. Because if it isn't, you're wasting your time and my time. I never got a single email. It's interesting. There is no evidence, there's no silver bullet to knock a creationist out. I have to say in return that if someone wants to believe in evolution, there really is not a silver bullet either, for except, logically speaking, reasoned as we did this afternoon, you would have to decide, I would have thought, in favour of intelligence, wouldn't you? Hard to beat the argument. If I put the prophecies together, and if I put together that brilliant account of Genesis, rightly understood, magnificent, I can see that the God that exists and the God that is there wants you, wants me to know who he is. And what he is, is this. He goes out of his way to say, I made the earth and I created man on it. You are not a cosmic accident. I'm not. We are not a cosmic accident. Bible says we were created in the image of God. Now we've lost much of the image, if you like. But we still are. We still are. I, my hand, stretched out the heavens. It's an amazing thing. You study the universe. It's absolutely incredible. And all their host I have commanded. God says, I'm the creator. He is a creator. That is what he says he is. Any fool can count the seeds in an apple. Only God can count all the apples in one seed. I like that, Robert Schuller. It's quite rather nice. What is comforting is this, when he says, when I, there's a God and he says, I made it all, I know that I have nothing to fear for he's with me. The wonderful thing about God is that he says, he says Jesus said that, didn't he? He said, I, I'm with you. I'm with you till the end of time. So whatever you go, whatever you do, you connect with him. He is with you. You're not out of his sight. And as you are sitting here, he has never taken his eyes off any of you. And so, fear not for I am with you. The same prophet as I has said that. I love that. I really, really do. You know, it's comfortable to know, comforting to know that God is the creator. He speaks into existence. I can't explain that it is beyond my capacity and knowledge. Who am I that I should know? But I look forward to an eternity where the, the secrets, where the, the mysteries will be, will be explained, how we will be forever learning. And so I trust him. I trust him because I know because he's the creator that he's in control. He is in control. And the wonderful thing is, the wonderful thing is, uh, he cares about his creation, and let me put it to you even stronger. He loves his creation. And you're part of his creation. And a God that then becomes man and pays a penalty, makes it right, earns the right to impart into you and me the capacity to obey. I think that's, that's even a greater miracle than the first living cell. What kind of love is that? Wonderful, wonderful God we worship. 
And he is, he is, always was, your creator. And there's good reason to love him back. We have a special item. We do. invite you now to bow your head as we uh, dismiss you with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can call you our Father and that all good things indeed come from your hand. You are the creator. You are the one that brought us here. And you are the one who wants us to be with him for eternity. It's a wonderful, wonderful thought 
looking into and learning about all the wonderful works of your hands. And what a wonderful God you are, how patient you are, that despite the intrusion of sin, you accept us and you want us to be saved into eternity. Help us to understand this and grasp this. Your love is so strong and so profound. May it drive us in a response of love to keep your commandments, to do your will, and to be good and kind to our fellow men. Lord, we ask for the blessing upon the fellowship, for the food that has been prepared. We thank you that uh, you were amongst our midst. Your presence was here. And may the sweetness of the moment accompany us throughout the week as we will me again meet in worship and in praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.